Number one tells us that the relationship between the amount of time that a car is parked in hours and the cost of parking in dollars can be described with a function. So we've got the time the car is parked and then we have the cost of the parking. Identify the independent variable and the dependent variable in this function. So the independent variable is the one that is changing and impacting the other. And so it is the time the car is parked is our independent variable. And then the dependent variable, the cost of that parking depends on how long that we're there. So then the cost depends on that. Describe the function with a sentence in the form of what is a function of the other thing. So this is the output or the cost is a function of time. So the dependent variable is a function of the independent variable. So you always want to put the dependent in there is a function of the independent. Suppose the cost per hour to park is $3 per hour with a maximum cost of $12. Sketch a possible graph. So we would have the time as our horizontal axis and then the cost as our vertical axis. And um, so we would want to label the um, scale here. So our time, I'm just going to count by ones. So one, two, three, and you can fill this whole thing up or you don't really need to because you're just counting by ones. I'm going to anyways. Um, and then I'm going to just count by, it's $3 per hour. So to make it easy on myself, I'm just going to count by threes. So I'm just going to do this as 3, 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. And really, we don't need these because the maximum is 12. So it's not going to go over $12, um, but I'll leave those on there. And then when we go ahead and plot this, so for one hour of parking, so if we park for, well, if we park for zero hours, it costs us $0, right? If we park for one hour, it costs us $3. Two hours costs us $6. Three hours is $9. Four hours is $12. Five hours is $12 because remember that maximum is 12. So everything after four hours is just going to cost us $12. And then you can connect these. So let me get a line here. And you can connect those and this would be a possible graph of that. D asks us to identify one point on the graph and explain what it means. So take any point you want. Um, I'm going to do 2, 6. So the point 2, 6, remember that the x variable or the x coordinate is the time and the y coordinate is the cost. So this is saying that it costs $6. Let me write costs. So it costs $6 to park for, and then two, um, and then I was just going to show you up here, two hours. So it's giving you the, the time in hours. So for two hours. You could choose other points too, right? So you could have chosen, like, let's say we choose this one, 712. Um, and so 712 would be a similar idea here where the 7 is your time and the 12 is your cost. So in this case, it would cost $12 to park for 7 hours. Number two, the price... The prices of different burgers are shown on the sign. Based on the information from the menu, is the price of a burger a function of the number of patties? So remember that that's saying that this price of the burger is the dependent 
is a function of the number of patties, the independent. So that would mean that the number of patties is determining the price of our burger and explain your reasoning. And so we can take a look here and we, you know, see that the cost is going up, right? As these burger patty numbers go up, it's it's about $3.50 for one patty and then $6.80 for two patties. I'm sorry, for four patties. But what we see here is that we have both of these have two patties, but their costs are different. So this tells us that the price is not a function of the patty because we cannot have a dependent variable that comes from two different, um, I'm sorry, we can't have it be a function if our independent variable gives us two different costs. Okay, so our independent variable, this one, if we have two patties, needs to go to one cost. Okay, this has to be an output of only one cost. And in this case, our two patties goes to $4.09 and it goes to $4.59. So you can't have, this can't happen. So can't have the independent variable um, go to different outputs. Number three, the distance a person walks D in kilometers is a function of time in minutes since the person, um, since the walk begins. Select all true statements about the input variable in this function. So remember when we write it like this with this sentence frame from number one, this first part is the dependent variable. Okay, and our dependent variable is always our output. And then that is a function of time and that is the independent variable. What it's a function of is the independent variable and that is your input. So this first one says that the distance is the input. That's not true. Our distance is our output, okay? So our distance is not the input, it's the output. So this is false. B says the time of day is the input. And time for sure is the input, but it's time since the walk begins, not the time of day. So this is false. C, the time since the person starts walking is the input. That's true. T represents the input. T is our minutes. That's our input. So this is true. D represents the input. That's false. D is the distance and that's our output. So this is false. The input is not measured by any particular unit. False because it's measured in minutes. So that's a particular unit. G, the input is measured in hours. That's false. Again, it's in minutes. And then for each input, there are sometimes two outputs. That's false. A function cannot have different outputs for the input. So this is false. Number four, it costs $3 per hour to park in a parking lot with a maximum of $12. So this is from question number one. Explain why the amount of time the car is parked is not a function of the parking cost. So this is saying that this would be our independent variable and time would be our dependent variable. So flipping around from what we said originally. So if I just make like a table of values of this, okay, thinking about that situation that we've already done, the cost and the time. Just so we can kind of look at it. So we had the, you know, cost at, um, when the time was $4, right? The cost was 12 because it's $3 an hour. 
Um, and then when it was five hours, it was 12. When it was six hours, it was 12. So we had all of these, and maybe we can put in three so we can see one where it wasn't. So prior to this, the $9 cost was three hours. Um, but for this, you can't have this happening where we have different, where we have the same input that's going to all these different outputs. That means it's not a function. Okay, the input, whoops, the input cannot go to different outputs. Or really the same input, right? So the 12 can't go to different numbers. So if it's an in, if it's a function, all of these inputs go to different outputs. So we can't have this where 12 is going to all sorts of different times. Number four, here are the clues for a puzzle involving two numbers. Seven times the first number. So I'm just going to write this out. So seven times the first number that I'll call X plus six times the second the second number, which we have to use a different variable because it's a different number than the first one, so I'll say y is equal to 31. Second clue, three times the first number, and we called the first number x, minus 10 times the second number, which we called y, equals 29. What are the two numbers? Explain or show your reasoning. So you could do a, three different things here. You could do substitution, You could do elimination, or you could graph these. So substitution is usually pretty easy if you can solve one of the for one of the variables, um, like get x alone or y alone, or if let's say you had a three x up here and down here, then you could substitute in. Um, that doesn't look very easy here because we've got no multiples of each other. Elimination would be nice if you could get the X's to be opposites or the same, or you could get the Y's to be opposites or the same. Um, and we can do that, but it's going to require that we multiply both equations by a number. So we can, um, it's just not super fast and easy. And the third way is to graph. And so I just chose to graph this one. So I just went to Desmos and graphed it. And because um, you can just type the equation in just as it looks without having to really manipulate it at all. And then where these lines cross, that's the solution. So this first number is our X and that second number is our Y. So the first number was 5.5 and the second number was negative 1.25. Number six, to keep some privacy about the students, a professor releases only summary statistics about student scores on a difficult quiz. Based on the information, what do you know about the outliers in the student scores? So remember, outliers are one and a half times the IQR above or below your, your quartile one and three, okay? So we need to figure out what the IQR is, and that's where you subtract these two numbers. So our IQR, you subtract your quartiles. So 76 minus 57, which gives us 19 as our interquartile range. Then we're going to need to multiply this by one and a half. And when we multiply this by one and a half, we get 28.5. So now outliers are going to be further than this away from the Q1 or Q3. So when we take this 76 and we add 28.5, and when you do that, so 76 plus 28.5, you get 104.5. So anything above 104.5 is an outlier. 
then we take quartile one and we subtract that 28.5 to get our lower bound. And 57 minus 28.5 gives us 28.5 as our lower boundary. So anything below 28.5 is going to be an outlier. So then when we look here, we see our maximum is 100. So that's not an outlier. But we do see that our minimum is 12, which is below the 28.5. So we have at least one outlier um, on the lower end of the data. We have none on the upper end because 100 is our max, which isn't an outlier. Um, so there aren't any on the upper end, which means there's not any on both. And we do have enough information to figure out that there is an outlier on the bottom end of the data. Number seven, an airline company creates a scatter plot showing the relationship between the number of flights at an airport and the average distance in miles travelers travel to get to the airport. The correlation coefficient is negative 0.52. Are they correlated? I mean, I would say slightly. Remember, um, or another way to say this is weak, right? So slightly meaning weak. So there's a weak negative correlation since this is a negative number. Remember that a strong correlation is really when R is greater than 0.8, either positive or negative. Um, and so this one has a, has a pretty weak correlation if there's any correlation. Do either of the variables cause the other one to change? And I would say no. Um, it's highly unlikely that the number of flights causes, or like how far the, the number of kite, the number of flights causes the distance that somebody ch lives to change, right? Um, so changing the number of flights offered doesn't change where people live. So if an airport just increases the number of flights, it doesn't change the fact that people still live where they live. Um, so it's unlikely that these impact each other at all. Plus with a negative 0.52 correlation coefficient, they're barely even associated. Let alone um, causing each other to happen. So no, 